Hi folks, welcome back. Uh, this is the second of our quick and dirty uh, PowerPoint with audio uh, lectures that are going to be available on both YouTube and Canvas. So pick the platform that you are best able to get into. All right, this is chapter six, the newspaper chapter. Let's get into it. I like this quote from Rachel Maddow because I think a lot of people, not just a lot of young people, but a lot of people in general, take their little local newspaper for granted. I mean, let's face it, it's not a very impressive mass medium. But I, I agree with, with Rachel Maddow that you know sometimes the only ones who are really paying attention to the city council of your little town or the school board meeting or the water board or what have you who do have an impact on, on people's lives. That sometimes it's only the little local newspaper that is slogging through that and trying to interpret for its readers what's important. Let's get to the history of, uh, of newspapers in the U.S., which also, uh, to some degree, kind of parallels the, uh, the evolution of freedom of expression in the United States. The first American newspaper is Public Occurrences, Both Foreign and Domestic, Benjamin Harris, publisher. Not a great beginning. Uh, Harris was kind of a bold fellow. He did not seek any permission from the uh, colonial government, and he went out there and he reported a controversial story. It was about a philandering French king. Well, what did he get for his efforts? He got thrown into jail. <laughs> the, the, the paper was, uh, was gone after one issue, and Mr. Harris never published again. Now, please note, colonial America, there is no U.S. Constitution, there is no Bill of Rights, there is no First Amendment. Censorship is unquestioned in some quarters. Um, Benjamin Franklin has uh, uh, really something to contribute to the history of American newspapers. He first started working for his older brother, James, at the New England Courant. And at one point, James got, uh, well, he, he, he had some problems with the government and got thrown into jail. Uh, luckily, he had his little brother to replace him as publisher-editor. And Ben Franklin had some good ideas. First, he was not so obviously challenging authority that he would get thrown into jail. That, that just wouldn't do anybody any good. Instead, he tried to push the boundaries of what his paper could say a little bit at a time. And so after a period of years, eh, considerable progress was made. Ben Franklin also helped to stabilize the finances of the newspaper. He reasoned that maybe most of the money that comes in will be from uh, selling the paper, but hey, maybe we can make additional income by selling messages, advertising in the paper. Hey, it made his, his newspaper uh, unusually economically successful. He went on to found uh, another newspaper and a magazine. The early American newspapers were, were not for everyone, in part because not everyone could read. Uh, these early elite newspapers, they weren't all bad. Uh, one thing that I, that I can say in favor of them is that they really did write about serious topics. For example, the Federalist Papers, which is a discussion of how the American Republic should be structured. Uh, such important essays that if, if you take any serious uh, college level uh, political science class, you will run into the Federalist Papers. Uh, well, 
those essays were originally in the papers of this era. Now, what they weren't were they were not neutral. You know, the, the idea of newspapers is neutral, objective vehicles. That just that was a concept that didn't quite exist yet. You know, if you think of them more like today's cable news channels, where they have a point of view, okay, uh, then you would be you'd have kind of a good basic concept of what they were like. Another thing they were was darned expensive. Now I know six cents, that doesn't sound like very much, but think of it this way. During this era, a pint of whiskey was five cents. Oh, this would explain why more people were getting drunk than reading. I believe that real mass media in the United States begins in the early 1830s. And it's because three factors came together. They converged. The first was that the printing press was hooked up to the most powerful engine yet developed, the steam engine. And by the early 1830s, uh, you could buy a top-of-the-line steam-powered printing press that could print 4,000 copies of a four-page newspaper in a single hour, just unimaginably fast. Jacksonian democracy was another reason why a truly mass newspaper could be possible by the early 1830s. You know, Andrew Jackson uh, was the first president to hire his own speech writer and article writer. And there was a very practical reason for that. President Jackson, who grew up on the frontier in Kentucky, he could barely read and write. It was a priority of President Jackson's two terms in office. And by the way, this does not uh, condone some of the uh, less savory parts of uh, President Jackson. But one good thing you can say about him was that he did, he did promote uh, free public education. Again, you know, not, not for everyone. Uh, free public education and mass literacy. Third thing that happened that made a true mass newspaper possible is that the Industrial Revolution which had been written about by uh, economist Adam Smith in his seminal book, The Wealth of Nations, had finally, by the early 1830s, come to the big cities of America's Northeast. It meant that people were coming from the countryside to take jobs in the big city. They were staffing assembly lines that were mass-producing products that, frankly, needed mass advertising to sell. The penny press newspapers were newspapers that were written for a popular audience and they cost a single penny. The first of these penny press newspapers, and you know, probably the most, the most famous, is the New York Sun. It was a newspaper that was written not for the elite, but for the humble factory worker. Hence its motto, it shines for all. When he started out, the publisher was only 22 years old. Benjamin Day was able to sell his paper for a single penny versus six cents charged by his competitors. And you know, you think about you know uh, restaurants that will undercut another restaurant on a meal by a little bit, or a car maker that will build a competing model and sell it for a little bit less, but I don't know how you sell something for only one-sixth of your competition unless you have a whole different way to make money. So, text me with your ideas about how he was able to undercut his rivals so dramatically on price, and yet still hope to turn a profit. Now. One of the things that the New York Sun was not was 
it was not above uh, kind of playing fast and loose with the truth. Probably the most famous series of articles that the New York Sun ever ran were the Moon articles. And these articles were just fabulously popular. Now, the way the articles worked was that uh, the Sun was uh, allegedly in contact with a great astronomer in Johannesburg, South Africa. Note, so far away that if anyone wanted to check, it would take the better part of a year to figure out whether this guy actually existed or not. Well, the, the, uh, this great astronomer just kept sending letters to the Sun and every time he would improve his telescope, he would see more and more amazing things on the moon. Uh, the New York Sun helped the imaginations of their readers by creating woodcut illustrations like this one. Here you have some moon people. They are cavorting under a moon tree in front of their moon village. Oh, there's a moon buffalo there in the background. And these things that look like dancing bears these are actually giant moon beavers, according to the New York Sun. Well, eventually, the more educated uh, folks in, in New York were able to figure out that, oh, come on, this is just a hoax. Now, you would think that uh, when the Sun's you know, lightly educated readers realized that they had been deliberately fooled, you would have thought they would have just never bought the newspaper again. But that's not what happened. The New York Sun remained a very popular newspaper for a long time to come. It did eventually go out of business in 1952. Yellow journalism is a term you don't hear much anymore. Um, you can consider it kind of a, a synonym for uh, sensationalistic journalism. And I think yellow journalism says something about capitalism and its effect on journalism. You know, if, if we have 10 factories all making pencils, I, I feel pretty good about that. You know, I mean, as long as we have you know, some simple regulations, uh, the lead isn't poison, it isn't radioactive, or, 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 or what have you, then you know, I'm all for you know, open competition in the, in, in the pencil business. And I guess I'm for open competition in journalism too. However, there is a unfortunate side effect. And that is that when newspapers or other news outlets are desperately trying to capture the audience from a lot of other uh, competitors, the, uh, the urge is oftentimes to out-exaggerate, out-sensationalize your competition, and that's what happened in the 1890s. You know, two of the most famous newspaper publishers in American history were prime practitioners of yellow journalism in the 1890s. Joseph Pulitzer, think about the Pulitzer Prize. You know, in many ways, Mr. Pulitzer was, was, was an exemplary fellow. Uh, he was a Hungarian immigrant who emigrated to America, taught himself English, became a reporter on the English language St. Louis Post-Dispatch. When the Post-Dispatch was about to go out of business due to being terribly in debt, Mr. Pulitzer agreed to take ownership of the newspaper for no money, but he would be responsible for its debts. He turned that newspaper around to profitability. In fact, it is still owned by the Pulitzer Corporation. And being a fellow of great ambition, he had to play on a bigger stage. So he bought another failing newspaper, uh, the New York World, and that put him in direct competition with the other famous newspaper publisher, William Randolph Hearst. These newspapers and others battled it out for street sales daily. You know, the little ragtag army of newsies, you know, the little boys who would uh, 
buy a hundred newspapers for 67 cents and then try to sell them on street corners. Now these these newspapers made sure the newsies had very sensationalistic headlines to holler out to workers as they were getting off their shifts. At the height of this, or I don't know, the depth of this, Mr. Hearst in particular got the nation involved in a war that probably didn't have to be fought. The USS Maine was a steamship that had been in service for some number of years. It was moored in Havana Harbor, and it blew up in the dead of night. Everyone agrees it was a terrible tragedy. Many American sailors lost their lives in that explosion. But the question is, why did it explode? Well, it could have been a boiler explosion that tended to happen on older steamships like the Maine. Mr. Hurst, on the other hand, was, was completely convinced that it was a Spanish terrorist bomb. And he used his New York Journal and his other newspapers around the country, and including in Los Angeles and San Francisco, to urge readers to contact their members of Congress and to avenge this atrocity. Remember the main was the slogan. And within weeks, Mr. Hurst got his war. It's probably worth noting that Spain was completely unprepared for war. Uh, the U.S. won pretty quickly. A war started by newspapers. Newspapers have faced competition from other media for a long time, long before the internet. By the 1930s, radio really created a sort of terror in the newspaper business. It was clear that for breaking stories, oh my gosh, the bridge is out, uh, a tornado is approaching, a plane just crashed, that radio was very good at getting those breaking stories out immediately. Well. Newspaper adjusted by becoming more interpretive, more analytical. Why did the plane crash? Uh, what are we going to do now that this bridge is out? By the 1960s, television news, especially local television news, had developed uh, to such a degree that it had become sort of uh, unbeatable competition for afternoon newspapers. Circling back to William Randolph Hearst for a moment, the Hearst newspaper in Los Angeles was the Herald Examiner. And in the early 1990s, due to competition from television after many years of decline, the Herald Examiner went out of business. In 1980, CNN began. And with that began the 24-hour news cycle. Newspapers which, up until approximately this time, if there was a truly, truly big story, they would put out an extra edition. Well, now cable could do the broadcast equivalent of, a, of an extra uh, at any minute. And so newspapers concentrated on just usually having one morning edition. By the turn of the millennium, newspapers were going online. They had websites. And it would have been um, predictable that people from Los Angeles would go to latimes.com and people from Kansas City would go to kcstar.com and People from Chicago will go to the chicagotribune.com, but that isn't really what happened. The news aggregators, Yahoo News, Google News, Apple Newsstand, they began, they and others, began to aggregate articles from various sources that usually people could read for free. It 
created a uh, additional difficulty in newspapers becoming profitable online. In the decade just concluded, uh, more and more people began to uh, uh, began to get their news, at least to some degree, and with wildly varying levels of quality, uh, through their social media accounts. Newspapers are still trying to figure out how to be consistently relevant on the social media platforms that are popular. We now start the second half of this chapter. This is Newspapers Today. Well, if the 1890s arguably had so much newspaper competition that uh, it hurt quality, today it is uncomfortably the other way around. Uh, many newspapers have a, at least a newspaper monopoly in the cities where they operate. In Los Angeles, I'm not sure that's really the case. Uh, we have, in, in Los Angeles, we have the LA Times, we have the Daily News, which mostly concerns itself with the San Fernando Valley, but is somewhat of a metro daily. Uh, we have La Opinion, if you speak Spanish. Uh, a concerning thing is that many newspapers are owned by uh, large corporate owners who have many cities, many newspapers in many cities, and therefore don't particularly have the best interests of each city in mind. The profitability picture of newspapers is that the truly national newspapers New York Times, Wall Street Journal, so forth, they're, they're faring pretty well, reasonably well. The little community newspapers, uh, they are eking out a modest existence. It's the metropolitan newspapers that are really in the middle, you know, those, those big, formerly, you know, quite powerful uh, local or regional newspapers that are facing the worst uh, money problems. So that said, let's talk uh, about the Los Angeles Times and what has happened to it in recent years. After being owned by the Chicago Tribune Company, which eventually uh, changed the name um, of its newspaper holdings to TRONC, which is a tortured acronym that stands for Tribune Online Content. Well, TRONC sold the LA Times and the San Diego uh, Union uh, to Dr. Patrick Shushiong, a Los Angeles area biotech billionaire, uh, summer 2018. Dr. Shushiong made a very difficult decision. And you know, for those of us who are Angelinos, it was very, very hard to see the LA Times newsroom leave its historic location literally across the street from LA City Hall. But it, it's going to sound a little glib, but it's very true. The Times pretty much got gentrified out of downtown LA. The, the space that they occupied became too expensive uh, 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 for them to keep. And so now the, uh, the newsroom is near the airport, near LAX in El Segundo. Uh, one thing that is definitely better about the Times is that it now has a staff that looks considerably more like the tremendously uh, diverse city that it, it reports on. Uh, you know, one terrible old story about the Times was about the Watts Riots, or Watts Rebellion, depending on your point of view, of August 1965. 
it was obviously a huge national story. In, in fact, the, the Times eventually won a Pulitzer uh, for its coverage of that event. But at the time, the Los Angeles Times did not have an African-American reporter on its staff, a major metropolitan newspaper. Uh, that would be unimaginable now. Let's talk about community newspapers and suburban newspapers. These are the, the papers, I think, especially the community newspapers, that Rachel Maddow was, was talking about uh, in, that, in that quote at the beginning of the chapter. And our graphic here is uh, our, our own local community newspaper, the Glendale News Press, which, by the way, also uh, is, is now owned by Dr. Xuxiang. And I, I think what makes uh, a community or suburban newspaper different uh, uh, than a Metro Daily is that, especially when you get down to the community level, they only report on what is happening very, very locally. Uh, you know, note this front page of the Glendale News Press. These two pedestrians hit in separate accidents. It was in Glendale. You could have a hundred pedestrians hit in San Bernardino and it would not make the Glendale News Press. And I, I think that's part of what makes community newspapers so irreplaceable. They are the ones who report that news you can't get anywhere else. I mean, you know, think about the two pedestrians hit in separate accidents. I, articles like this you say, well, you know, you know, what does it really mean? Well, it can lead to greater local conversation uh, about how can this be avoided? Is it a matter of crosswalks or speed limits or uh, law enforcement that needs to, you know, focus in a different way? So community and suburban newspapers. The ethnic press. African American newspapers go way back in the United States. 1827, gee, that would be 34 years before the, the, the Civil War. In Los Angeles, the uh, Los Angeles Sentinel uh, has been uh, published for more than 100 years and is one of the largest African American newspapers in the U.S. The Lozano family uh, began La Opinion in Los Angeles in 1926. Uh, and uh, some of the top Spanish language newspapers have, at least up until the world changed very, very recently, had been doing reasonably well uh, economically. Let's talk about the alternative press. You know, back in the 1960s, there were a few alternative newspapers like the Village Voice in New York or the Freep, the Los Angeles Free Press. And they were usually not liberal, they were lefty. <laughs> they were progressive, lefty, alternative, interesting publications. Well, as, uh, as these publications uh, uh, aged, they became a little bit more about economic uh, sustainability. So the free press, unfortunately, is long gone. Uh, the LA Weekly uh, began in the 19, late 1970s. And the weekly in its early years was an almost optimal mix of interesting journalism and what bands were playing around town, uh, movie reviews, you know, uh, restaurant reviews. And why that was kind of a golden era in a way was that you still had 
you know, the, the local, new, uh, local news coverage and political commentary, but the paper could also sustain itself economically with all those entertainment-related ads. So yes, I would say the LA Weekly, until recent years, uh, the Weekly has uh, very much cut back on, on its reporting, unfortunately. You know, another type of alternative newspaper is uh, uh, gay-themed newspapers. You know, as, uh, as more mainstream publications began, begin to cover uh, gay-related matters and accept gay-themed advertising, it has cut some of the ground out from under those pioneering LGBTQ newspapers. I think here in this slide I want us to think about what makes something a news story. I mean obviously not everything is newsworthy so what are the criteria? Well news is new. I think that's pretty clear. Uh, something that just happened is a candidate to be in the newspaper. Uh, something that happened 20 years ago, even if it's really, really big, it's not going to be brought up in the newspaper unless there is a recent reason why it ought to be there. So normally, the, uh, the horrible flu epidemic of 1918 wouldn't make the paper. But because we're all having our lives changed because of coronavirus, suddenly that very, very old story, ah, it's kind of new again. Proximity. Generally, we are more concerned about things that are happening close to us than things that are happening far away. As I record this, I'm in my office and me and the rest of society is becoming more and more concerned about the growing number of cases. And you know, we hear about the massive number of cases in Italy, but what we really worry about is, you know, how many are there in the United States? How many are there in California? How many in Los Angeles County? And oh my gosh, there are now cases in Glendale. Proximity. Prominence is a, is a news criterion. Uh, how many of you, as you listen to this, uh, know that uh, Tom Hanks and, and his wife uh, have coronavirus? As of this recording, it seems like their symptoms are quite manageable, and I, I certainly hope they recover. Uh, but note, we don't know the, the names of the other thousands and thousands of people who have this. Uh, but we know that they have it because they're prominent. Coronavirus is a huge consequence story. It's, does it affect people's lives? Does it affect a lot of people's lives? Does it affect a lot of people's lives in a meaningful way? I mean, just think about the consequence of this story. I mean, besides people getting sick and, you know, some dying. I mean, there is the consequence of how radically our lives have changed in such a short period of time. There is the economic aspect, not so, you know, not just the stock market plunging, but you know, all the folks uh, who have lost their jobs, who are worried about, you know, will they be able to make the house payment or the car payment? Rarity can be a news value. I mean, you know, there, there, there's an old, an old saying in the newspaper business: uh, uh, "Dog bites man." That's not a story. Man bites dog. Now you got a story. That's, that's, rarity. A human interest story is 
uh, typical people doing atypical things. Human interest is that uh, that person who who ties uh, government weather balloons filled with helium to an aluminum lawn chair so that he can float several thousand feet above his backyard in Long Beach. Yes, that really happened. In, I think it was in the 1990s. You know, human interest is that stuff that makes people say, "Oh my gosh, <laughs> did you hear about what that you know uh, what that waitress in Carson did?" You know that kind of thing. Now, I think that uh, between our increasingly uh, divisive politics and the coronavirus case, I, I, I think that maybe many of us are waking up to the idea that, yes, we have more information than ever before, but what information can we really rely on? And I think most newspapers take the truth seriously. And sometimes it is hard to make the call that this is the truth and that's debatable. You know, critics say the facts can't always be verified. The facts aren't always uh, beyond dispute. PolitiFact, which is my graphic here, PolitiFact is uh, a, an organization that looks at, among other things, uh, uh, campaign claims. And they have uh, a number of categories. You know, a lot of what politicians say are not completely true, but they're mostly true. Uh, politicians sometimes say things that are kind of true, kind of not. Okay. They're... Um, <laughs> Their, 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 their worst uh, grade is pants on fire, as in, oh, is it really untrue? Liar, liar, pants on fire. Another thing to think about regarding uh, newspapers and fact-checking is, what do you do as a reporter if, let's say, you're covering a campaign for mayor? And we're going to call the two candidates for mayor Larry Liar and Terry Truth. Terry Truth is a politician. Um, usually she says things that are true. Sometimes they're exaggerated, you know, sometimes they're a little self-serving, but, you know, she's more or less telling the truth. Larry, on the other hand, will just say whatever sounds good at that moment. Now here's the dilemma for the reporter covering that campaign. The reporter will go through what Terry said in her campaign appearance and will maybe push back a little bit in the story, but not too much. With Larry, you know, there's got to be constant correction. And here's where the problem comes in. The casual reader is liable to make the conclusion, oh my gosh, that reporter really hates Larry. Poor old Larry can't get two sentences out without uh, the newspaper jumping all over him. And frankly, I don't know what the solution is to that, but um, it's, it's a challenge for newspapers, especially in these hyper-partisan times. Well, speaking of these times, uh, you, you may think that newspapers are sort of uh, unchanging, but no, they, they are trying to adapt to the world that we live in now. Um, paywalls. Y you run into them if you're uh, getting stories from the Wall Street Journal or the New York Times. The LA Times has paywalls too. What more and more newspapers are doing is they will give you a few articles for for free per month, but after that the wall comes up and says, hey look, if you'd like to enjoy all our content, here's what it costs for an online uh, subscription. Newspapers are trying to be on the platforms where we, especially younger people, live their lives, uh, trying to have a more and more robust mobile presence 
uh, a, a greater relevancy on social media. Uh, more and more newspapers have studios in the newsroom where they will do podcasts and videos. Some newspapers are trying to shift away from the paper product and are trying to be a brand. I mean, the Washington Post, I, I think, is, is very clearly becoming a leading brand for national political reporting. The LA Times, I don't know. Maybe it'll become a international brand uh, for entertainment news. The publisher of the New York Times, uh, by the way, w whenever you see the acronym or the abbreviation NYT, that usually means New York Times. Uh, the publisher of the New York Times was quoted recently as saying, he, he could live if uh, the paper decided to to go paperless someday. Ambivalent means you know, he, could, he could go with it or he could do without it. The New York Times will go on either way. WAPO is uh, an abbreviation for Washington Post. Uh, Jeff Bezos uh, bought the Washington Post several years ago, uh, a man with a seemingly unlimited bankroll. And he is really, uh, Bezos has invested in very top-line journalistic talent. I mean, think of the Washington Post as like the New York Yankees, you know, some very wealthy sports team that just, you know, can afford to buy up a bunch of expensive free agents. And so what the Washington Post is doing is it is seeking to be uh, an internationally relevant publication. And this brings us to the end of chapter six, newspapers.